Um, welcome everyone uh, to the Quartz Africa Innovators panel. Um, we're delighted that uh, we have a full room. Um, Quartz is a digital media publication out of uh, New York. We focus a lot on what we describe as the new global economy. Our focus on Africa is very much uh, looking at the continent through a lens of uh, innovation, telling the stories of uh, how innovators are impacting the continent, are helping to change the narrative, are um, developing businesses and uh, impacting economies. My name is Yinka Adigoke. I am the Africa editor for Quartz. And um, I'm very excited about this panel um, because it's taken a little while to put together, but <laughs> also because um, these are just some of the most exciting uh, innovators on the continent doing uh, truly amazing things. And, and I'm not, actually, the thing is they, they've all done so much and they've all achieved so much. I'm not even gonna try to bother trying to um, do the usual sort of long intros. Um, I'm going to just try and get right into it uh, by getting them to tell their uh, innovation story to sort of explain to us um, how they, um, they started out and, and why innovation plays uh, such an important role. So I'm going to do the uh, thing of ladies first and I'll start with you, Patamata. <laughs> sure. Awesome. Tell us your innovation story. Thank you, Inka. Interestingly enough, um, I can't say I was born an innovator, but I became one for sure, and it came from witnessing, I think, two things that always go hand in hand when you look at the African context. One uh, is um, tremendous opportunities that we can see, both in terms of demography, in terms of economy and techno technology, but also witnessing the challenges. And to be more specific, on one hand, when I look, for instance, at the growth in terms of population, it is exciting, you know, it's because they were able to tap into, uh, you know, a very sizable manpower that China got to industrialize, for instance. But at the same time, it comes at a pace which is quite challenging. It's unseen in the history. I think uh, Europe took 150 years to go from um, 250 to 750 million um, inhabitants. Even China will take 100 years to go from 500 million to 1.5 billion people. And we actually are taking 60 years to go from 600 to 2.2 billion. So we need to find a very uh, innovative and massive way to educate, care for, employ, um, find good houses for a billion people. And all the ways won't work, right? And at the same time, when you look at opportunities, technology is today an amazing way to leapfrog development. And I think my peers will find and give so many exciting examples on how technology is leapfrogging access to goods. Yeah. So for instance, I used to be an e-commerce player and it was exciting to see how, for instance, in the US, you have one retail outlet for 400 inhabitants. In Africa, it's one for 60,000. So, you know, it's no wonder that when you propose a way to massify access to goods, it works. Same for financial services. We see, for instance, you know, half of Kenya GDP transiting through mobile wallets. And, and also looking at economic opportunities, it's often forgotten that out of the 10 fastest growing uh, economies worldwide, um, six to seven are African, and it has been ongoing for the fa past five years. But at the same time, we see so many challenges at the same, you right. know, in terms of access to capital, being able to scale, being able actually to, on one hand, look at how big are the markets, but on, on the other hand, execute locally. Mm -hmm. So it, it motivates me to become not only an entrepreneur a few years back, mm -hmm. but also today an investor, trying to back local founders that are exciting to use technology and solve some market failures while creating jobs at scale. And, and I think that's the type of innovation that could be helpful uh, right. to leapfrog development in Africa. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for that, Pastor Matter. I mean, we've been uh, talking for some years now, and I've followed your journey. It's been um, uh, a fantastic story. Um, I mean, but it, just for people who don't know, just talk us through how, you know, you realize like innovation is the answer, this is why. I have to do, not just start a business for the sake of it. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I think for me, um, I, I, am, I see myself as an activist, and so I consider entrepreneurship and innovation as tools of social change. Um, and, um, and that's what drives the work that I do. 
And so when I first got into the innovation ecosystem, in, uh, primarily in, in Nigeria with Yaba, um, the focus then was how do we reinvent the education system and introduce new kinds of talent that can support the ecosystem. And that led us to, to found uh, Andela, uh, which today is the largest engineering training and delivery platform on the continent. Um, and then after that, we, we started to ask ourselves, what are the barriers to this talent being able to create and capture value? And then we realized we didn't have a payment system that could connect African innovators to the global economy. And so we went and tackled that problem. And I think for me, you know, we're continuing on that path now, um, trying to define a future for Africa over the next 100 years, and then deciding to back the people and organizations that are building that future in the public interest. And um, for me, it's, uh, you can't do entrepreneurship in Africa and uh, not be present to the incredible challenges that yes. exist. The problems are evolving. They're what we call in our space wicked problems. And so naturally, solutions that you bring from Europe or America are useless in the face of these challenges. They're like trying to solve Ebola with a typical immunology mm -hmm. framework. And so because these are such rapidly mutating challenges, you have to um, attack these problems from two pole points. The first is really understanding that the magic of the continent is its talent and its human capital, not all the other stuff and figuring out ways to find the brightest and the best and back them to build sustainable solutions. And the second is an understanding that until the questions of justice are resolved, primarily through a new kind of capital structure, um, new kind of innovation for a better society philosophy, um, you're just playing financial engineering games. And unfortunately, I think my only disappointment so far has been that is the game capital has been playing with Africa, and that needs to change. Okay. That's, that's very, 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 I really want to get into that, the, the fascinating uh, part of this discussion. Uh, Chika, I'll come to you um, to tell us your story again. I, I, I met you many years ago. I think you were like fresh out of like, your master's program. Yeah, Georgetown, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, just talk us through how you uh, got started and because you've had about two or three yes, uh, yes. companies now. Uh, so what I would say is that, um, yeah, we actually met um, several years ago, and this was fresh when I was at Georgetown. And um, I love that all my fellow panelists have woven in the story of human capital. And that's where I yes, have right. started. That's where I still am. Um, and just has transformed in what part of the human capital chain that I uh, focus on. And so when I was you know, in the US, I realized I wanted to make serious impact. And I was always interested in the technology space. Ian, I've known you for several, <laughs> several years, you know, when we used to have conversations about um, tech. And so I moved back to uh, work on an organization called Talent Base, which was focused on payroll solutions. And you would sit here and say, oh, payroll, it's easy. It's, we've been doing it for several years in, in, in several nations, such as ADP in the US and also in, in the UK, but what I also had to humble myself and learn in Nigeria is that while the US has really moved forward in, in payroll, there were still a lot of manual issues that need to be solved and, and still we have a very informal market. And so as I was building talent base, I had to look at how can I make sure that employees are easily getting paid. Uh, there were still issues with pensions there were still issues with taxes and how can we create a system uh, that organizations can easily pay their employees every month. And so I had to go to the banks and start working with them, integrating to those systems. And, um, and even when I went to Silicon Valley and they taught me more about their systems, I realized that none of that works <laughs> in Nigeria. And, and so that's one of the key things that I, I realized about innovation is that really understanding your local market um, and, and learning how to adapt quickly as well, and, and really listening to the customers. Um, customer development is key, um, very key in, in Nigeria. But now, um, I transition out of talent base, and I realize the main issue is still human capital, um, and helping organizations find the best talent, because in order for all of our innovations to scale, we need the right people. Uh, we still need a lot of training, 
and specifically in technology, which is why Indela is key. And that's, there's other organizations that are making sure that um, there's more developers in the market. Uh, because not only can we employ developers across Africa, but we can actually employ these developers across the world. As developer talent is a global problem. It's not just an African issue. Okay. Excellent. And Bright, uh, <laughs> a veteran of the space. Um, Again, your story for the, for the I, I feel like almost everyone knows the great work you've done, but tell us a little bit about your story and then we can talk about the, the evolving role of, of innovators. So um, the journey begins from a clash between the deeply personal um, and the very public. In that, like E, I was also very much in the activism space, perhaps more radical than yours. Um, but then over time, I began to feel that Complaining about change not happening was not how I want to live my life. I want to be part of the people in the trenches fighting for that change. And the best way to create change sometimes is to actually go ahead and construct it, to show people a model of what an alternative could look like. So I had wanted to relocate from Europe back to Ghana to do this, um, but a few things happened that changed the inclination with which I brought myself to the task that I set for myself. One was that I had a skin condition that compelled me to shift to organic food. And the more I you know, saw changes in my body, the more this whole idea of organic agriculture became fascinating. So I'll pick up a box of cereal and look and say, why is it organic? And I'll see a seal on it and I'll say, that is why it's organic. Then this is your trust became so important because the only reason why I was paying more, 30%, 50% more for that box of cereal other than the other box of cereal was because some stamp of trust was telling it was organic. So the idea was, okay, how could we get farmers in Africa who already grow this produce organically by default to sell their produce in the West with these same labels? Then I realized that actually it wasn't that simple because there were just a few Western organizations that could give you that stamp of approval that you are organic. And they charge $6,000 a day. And the farmers, no matter how much we thought through how we could you know, build cooperatives and the rest of it, were just not willing to pay for anything. I mean, they were poor and they wanted somebody else to bear the cost. So my disappointment would probably have just led to despair. Somebody said it's the only forgivable sin. But uh, at one point, there was a documentary about counterfeits in Nigeria, of all places. And the more I looked into the problem, the more it became apparent to me that it was the same challenge in different clothing. So mothers were buying medicines, hopefully to save their infants, and then they will give these medicines to their children and they will not get well. But in this particular episode, 100 young infants have died because somebody had put in antifreeze. They have not only not made the medicine ineffective and useless, they are putting a poison in an attempt to cut costs. Now I thought, what if you could have a way in which you could verify that the medicine you're about to take is certified? It led me on a journey that in you know, fits of green complexity has taught me a lot about innovation. So in the first place, the, the idea was, okay, if we could get originality affirmed, that would be a simple way of solving the problem. So if the manufacturer mm -hmm. was a proper manufacturer, then they make the right thing. And if people are trying to copy it, you could protect the original product. Then we realized that, well, sometimes some of the manufacturers themselves are shady, so you needed to do more than just try and um, uh, affirm the originality of the product. You needed to actually revamp regulation. Luckily, I came from the activist public sector background, so I was happy to go try and work with government. So eventually what the solution became was an attempt to completely remodel the regulatory process by giving technology to governments so they can do the regulatory process in a much more transparent way. And so this is we started in Nigeria, starting with medicines. And eventually we move into cosmetics and then into automotive components. And currently our biggest growing space is in agriculture. So we've gone all the way back full back, circle. Back to where what we are trying to do is to help farmers in East Africa in particular, but now we've signed an agreement with Comesa so that allows us to do it in the 21 countries in Comesa, where farmers, when they buy seeds before they plant the seeds, can verify that the seed uh, is quality seed. And this is just more than just counterfeit seed or not counterfeit seed. This is whether it is properly certified by the local regulators, the germinator properly during the experiment, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that process means, therefore, that we are in the food security business. Because it is surprising to know that when it comes to the grains, which tends to be the staple in most parts of Africa, what you eat and what you plant is almost indistinguishable. So the maize you plant or the rice you plant and the one that you eat on the table is indistinguishable, but one is much more pricier. So people go outside, typically to China, 
bring in the grain for the table, but bring back right. as seed and sell them. And we're now providing the technology that enable farmers and the government and industry working together collaboratively around one platform to make that impossible. That's fascinating that you're working through the, the, throughout the ecosystem there. Do you think, how do you think the role of innovators in Africa is evolving? Do you, do you think they've been, you know, your work uh, is being taken more seriously? You know, or are you just seen as smart guys raising lots of money? <laughs> I think that, are, are people thinking more about innovation now? From the commercial and economic point yes. of view, there is increasing recognition that there's money to be made. There's no doubt about that. There's increasing recognition that there's money to be made. Socially, there is some awareness that some of our problems can only be solved through innovation. Not too long ago, South Sudan had the entire national passport system penned off because they couldn't afford to pay a company in Germany, which had the IP to the system. Got you. And now that is beginning to tell on people. What is not entirely apparent, though, in the transformation of mindset that is happening is that there's a geopolitical dimension to this. Yes. Sometimes I see myself and the work that I do with my organization as defenders of African sovereignty. We can't allow our content to become a dumping ground of crap from other countries. Yeah. Now, to do that, we need to build supply chain systems, regulatory systems, and defend them. And we need to have the technology and the systems to defend them. And no one is going to do that except us. Because we are the ones in the bullseye. Mm. So sometimes I see ourselves and the role that we play as innovators as defenders of African sovereignty, as defenders of African dignity. The problem is that that narrative hasn't yet become much more widespread. This mm. idea of the political economy of innovation. Think of it. In the 18th century, in the first half of the 18th century, the biggest empire in my part of the world, in my part of West Africa, was the Asante Empire. What many people don't realize is that the British tried to colonize Asante twice in that part of time, in that, in that period of time, and failed. They failed because Adasante had attained parity of arms with the British, almost entirely based on imported guns from Europe. So these people had imported guns from Europe until they built an army that could resist British forces. Mm. But something happened. They did not rapidly develop a local arms industry. And the nature of the industry, the arms industry changed in Europe. And Gatling guns and automatic guns became more popular in Europe. Unfortunately for them, that was technology the British and others were not willing to export. So when in the latter half of the 19th century, the British army invaded Asante, they had Gatling guns. The Asantes had no Gatling guns. If you read Gam Guns, Gems, and Steel, a popular book that most people have read, it's quite apparent that the innovation dynamic in geopolitics is extremely powerful. Mm. The ability to understand, for instance, that African genomics is quite different. Yeah. And therefore, in the world of personalized medicine, nobody's going to do it for Africa. We've got to go figure out our own genomic profiles and build medicine for them. And, and I think that dimension is not well understood. If, if I can add, uh, I, for too much, I do want to go, maybe. I should go first. Okay. okay. I think before you get there, yeah. you need to start with the politics before you get to the geopolitics. Mm. And this is my one concern. And it's the fact that before you get to the point where you can start to think about commercial innovators, which is most of what we are, as people who can defend the interest of a country and not be subverted by what I call government premiers, because oftentimes when that argument is made, what they're saying essentially is hand over the entire country's supply of sugar, or cement to Dangote. And that's not what we're trying to say here, <laughs> right? But what we're trying to say, first of all, is that the politics has to change. And I think that's what there is a growing understanding of, that entrepreneurs cannot just sit back and do their business and right. hope that they would be able to deliver value for their customers and ensure that their customers can continue to afford their products, yeah. right? Um, because there's prosperity and there's purpose in society. But now we now understand, or we're starting to come to a realization that we have to start to get involved in the politics as well. Yeah. And that means we probably have to wholesale, sweep out the government um, through democratic processes, of course. Mm -hmm. Then we can get to the point where geopolitics then becomes a topic. But if we don't handle the politics, what happens is geopolitics becomes an instrument of protectionism, which affects global trade, and becomes an, a, a tool for further impoverishing the poor who we're trying to support. So that's where I kind of come at from a different perspective on the geopolitics question. I don't want entrepreneurship, as it's currently used today, to be a tool for further impoverishing the poor. Right. I want it to be a platform for ensuring everybody has prosperity and purpose within their reach. Mm. 
this is something that Fatima is very passionate about. And I about. think building on that, basically, you, you spoke about innovators being defenders. And I think it's important that also innovators see themselves as enablers. Mm. For instance, my motivation to become a venture capitalist was actually to become a double bottom line venture capitalist, bringing profits, but trying to solve market failures. And if I take one, for example, I was always appalled looking at you know, global trade. Africa is only 3% or less over the years. And when you try to you know, look at the problems, there are so many. One of them is, for instance, access to capital for SMEs. Yeah. Another one you mentioned it is supply chain. And to give you a concrete example, like you know, I started deploying capital in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire last year, uh, trying to help farmers export globally. And uh, the reason why is sometimes logistic costs can be high, as high as 75% of the cost of goods sold. It's compared to 6% in the US. Mm. Um, it's, it's impossible you know, to be on a level playing field. And, and this way, we were able, let's say, to, to give them access to a global market. But it was not enough. And when I was an e-commerce player, so many fashion designers will tell me, that I'm excited to sell on your platform, but then you know, banks are not giving me you know, loans, loans and credits because you know, most of them are informal. Yeah. So I started, actually, funnily enough, in Cote d'Ivoire, on my own um, salary, giving a working capital advance. And it was so successful because they will get access to market and I will get more local assortments to local taste. And, and also we would be actually building kind of credit scoring model to enable real bankers or real people who are, you have the balance sheet deep enough to fund SMEs, but you don't have the way to deploy capital effectively. And that's why I don't see innovation as you know, another layer. We are not like apart from the society. No. I think we are an horizontal. You know, in healthcare, in education, in retail, in, in so many sectors, we have a role to play as an enabler of the global economy and ideally to fast track development. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shika, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, when we, what is, it's something that, that Bright said that I was just thinking about there about, you know, this defending uh, the country or your markets um, and the need for you know, original innovation which belongs to our African countries or African businesses, whoever it is, African entrepreneurs. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you know, we notice across uh, the continent is we don't have um, the same sort of pipeline of innovation via the academic sort of uh, routes which we've seen in Silicon Valley and, and in other markets. Um, is there a way, have you, have you thought about, do you, is there a way that can uh, change or the, what, what could be done to uh, imp, you know, support that? So unfortunately, that answer is, is quite layered, to be honest. And the reason why I say this is um, let's, let's remove tech and just talk about you know, basic jobs that people are applying to. Um, and I recruit candidates all the time. And the issue I see, if we just look at a very basic level, is things like reading comprehension. Um, a lot of candidates I speak to um, do not have a very high level knowledge of Excel. So their knowledge of Excel is I just enter in data, uh, PowerPoint. And these are th challenges that I face all the time when I'm recruiting for candidates. And so my pipeline is quite small. And you know, that's actually the reason why I started asking myself, you know, as much as I want to help SMEs find the right talent, I almost need to step back and start training, which is why Endelo is created at a tech level. But we need to create more Endelas for different industries, finance, and HR, and business administration, because a lot of these candidates just do not have the skill set. And again, the reason why I say this is layered is because the skill set was never taught at an educational level. So in the US, for example, um, throughout you know, kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade, you are learning reading comprehension. And you're seeing different aspects of reading comprehension throughout your schooling. So by the time you get you know, to a, your first job, you're able to understand abstract concepts. And you're able to be flexible and adaptable when things are thrown at you that you may not know firsthand. Uh, but again, my clients always say that you know, I have my, my um, employees are not able to quickly adapt or shift or change. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to literally be told exactly what to do. Um, so I do feel like in order to solve the pipeline issue, more training institutions need to happen, uh, specifically on a vocational level, as well as looking at other skill sets that are going to be needed, even data science, uh, product management. Right. There's so many different um, 
areas that I feel like we need to step back and do a lot more training. And then again, when we look at politics, we need to put more pressure on the government to change the schooling system. It's very outdated. It's extremely outdated. And we're not preparing the, this huge youth that is bubbling, literally, for the future of work. And so that also needs to be changed because if we don't, we're gonna have a serious brain drain. And already I see countries coming into Nigeria looking to hire our talent. And these talents are going to these other countries because they see it as a, new, a greener pasture for them because they feel that I have, you know, I, I did all this training on my own. I did not get this at an educational system. I put money into training into myself, and yet I don't see enough opportunities to become a data scientist, to mm. do things in product management, to do things beyond you know, what I have already done in this country. So again, we need to put pressure on the government in order to change the educational system so that they're actually prepared for the future of work. Yeah. I mean, you guys are already um, bringing up this issue of policymakers and how they can support your work, because you, n none of you I know are asking for government help or what have you, but you do think uh, that policymakers have an impact. Uh, what's, your, what's your view, Bright, on how, so, on how they can support the work? So I'll uh, contextualize broadly. it like this, and that goes back to the point that you was making, uh, which is, it's not about nativist thinking, you know, to think of technology as indigenous or not indigenous. Yes. But fundamentally, my experience and my understanding of history is that you cannot copy well if you cannot create at all. The capacity to copy is inherent in the capacity to create. And we saw, we've seen that in all the East Asian miracles. Toyota, the reason why they built Toyota Way and was so powerful over time as an industrial transformation mindset was because when the weaving loom, the automation and the mechanization of the weaving loom in Europe came to Japan, they knew that to copy it more effectively, as opposed to just import, they had to innovate on top of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to just copy something, they might as well just buy from the original yeah. source. The only reason it makes sense to be able to absorb new technology is your ability to enhance what you received. The interdependence of different formats of innovation is critical. We are doing work right now in cold chain, and here I'm talking about the policymaker dimension. Yeah. And in the area of coaching, what most people don't realize is that there are a lot of biomedical products that are heat unstable. To transport them and to store them, you need to be aware of the effect of heat on these products. Blood is one, insulin is another, vaccines is another. The challenge is that it's very difficult when you look at the product to tell if it was stored properly in the right temperature or not. Now we've gone to build a system where you use polymers, very simple chemical polymers, as tagants and markers on the packaging of the vaccine or the blood or the insulin or whatever. Now these tagants or markers shift slowly with temperature cumulatively and they create a pattern. Obviously we are not inventors in the chemical dimension, but here's what's interesting. The work that we've done in information technology means that we understood the potential for computer vision to use these polymers to tell with a webcam as the product passes whether indeed the temperature that it's been stored in throughout was proper. No way could we have copied the polymer knowledge in Europe and America, uh, in Asia if because without our computer vision capability, we couldn't add value to it. Why would I be worried about polymers if I don't have a way to create a new way to tell a vaccine, to tell whether a vaccine was stored properly or not? So the ability to copy requires the ability to create because creation creates absorption capacity. And that absorption capacity, the ability to absorb innovation, is where policymakers don't get. So there's often the point that why do we have to create or how do we have to invest in R&D because at the end of the day, you can just simply import a technology. It makes no sense. Yeah. There is no country in East Asia where alongside trying to copy, we're not trying to create enhancements that were locally unique and providing local advantage. So policymakers have to understand this. It's not purely a matter of total factor productivity. Just import as much technology as you can. We tried that in the 60s. In Kroma, in Nyerere, Ufoi Buani, I can mention so many policies off the top of my head. Modi Bokita, all of these people tried massive industrialization based on importing Eastern European technology, technology from East Germany in particular. It all failed. By the 1970s, industries had collapsed all across Nigeria. All the attempts to try and supplant the, the granite pyramids and the rest of it had failed. Ask yourself why? Why could we not import enough technology from East Germany and stir up 
an industrial, uh, an industrial revolution in Africa. Because to copy effectively, you need the ability to absorb. And to create the capacity to absorb, you need to create local capabilities that are unique to the culture, to the environment, and to the history. But on that point, e, the, the, the point about policymakers as well is how do you, as the innovator, how, are, how protected are you? When you come up we with don't these. expect protection from the government. In actual well, fact, sometimes well, they are you, biggest enemies. You don't enemy. have protection, and you, you spend all this time investing, taking investor money, starting something, and somebody else can just It's a game of it. cat and mouse most times, right? <laughs> so I'll give you a practical example. She talked about the fact that we need more Mandela's. Perhaps. In a real society, right, with a functioning political and business yeah. class, there should be universities. Mandela should be a functioning yeah. local university creating talent to both for global export and yeah. for local consumption. But again, we don't have political and business elite that are responsible. So what do we do? We play the cat and mouse game. We take foreign capital. We create what should exist, not as a business, but as now, uh, 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 but, but as a public good, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we create a business out of it. And we find a way to return value, you know? And Della has grown, investors are happy, everybody's fine. Same thing with Flutterwave, right? It makes no sense that your average small business in Nigeria cannot do business with the rest of the world. But again, we don't have a responsible political and business elite. So what do we do? We take investors' money, we build a business out of it to solve the problem and return capital. We can keep playing those games, but at some point, it gets tiring. Yeah. I have to be honest, right? Um, and the challenge there really is, you know, um, and I've, I've I wouldn't say, I have tried to see reason with an older generation of Africans who believe this is how societies should work. We should just worry about our own personal interests and leave the public interest to the dogs. It's hard, but it seems to be the pattern for the way the societies are being designed. And for, for us, I think for the younger generation, what we've realized is we just have to build new models by brute force or otherwise, right? And so. We take the innovations that exist, we've democratized the knowledge, that's the beautiful thing about the internet. We don't have to go to the universities. We don't have to build those universities anymore. We can create through a mobile phone or a laptop the avenues for learning, whether the government gives us or the private sector comes together to deliver a working education system. Now, the hard work, which is the work that we have to do now, mm -hmm. is putting the pieces together and supplanting the old so that the new can thrive. And this, I think, is the mission of an African innovator. You unfortunately do not live in societies where your business, your elites have the public interest, right? So you have to maintain a position where you take on the role of defending the public interest. Yeah. But I think still it's, it's still necessary, right, to, to have government in intervention. We won't, we won't wait for it. One of the reasons is, you know, we create societies for 99 years when we register, and, and they have maybe political agenda for five years. That being said, if we say that innovation is here for the betterment of the whole society, for instance, we need cheaper access to internet everywhere. I can't understand why it, it costs the same, um, you know, like the same amount of data to produce in Rwanda, which is a landlocked con country, will cost eight dollars, and in Cote d'Ivoire it will cost sixty dollars. Cote d'Ivoire has access to the sea you know, and, and, and marine cables. It doesn't make sense. Likewise, whenever uh, they want to raise tax fast, they will always look at, for instance, telco sectors, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't make sense because when you look at the global picture in terms of cost benefit, when you make the price of data more expensive, yeah. you are actually um, making people who need the most access to this innovation we are all talking about. You know, you are actually um, preventing them from accessing them. So we, we need them both at a macro and micro level. For instance, yeah. I don't know, global, online customs, we need it if we want to be able to fulfill this promise of uh, export SMEs 100% online. So we need government intervention, macro, micro, but we can't afford to wait for them because it takes ages and sometimes we don't have yeah. them enough uh, conscious of the role of innovation in the society and also sometimes enough conscious of the public interest. Well, but I think we have to be clear about what the problem is because if we keep talking around the real problem, which is the politics, we're not going to solve it. It's very simple. In 2012, I just came into Nigeria. We had a broadband commission. We knew what the problem was to get broadband in the hands of people, eliminate right of way. We've known that for the past, what, seven years? 
We still haven't done it. Why? Because state governors and their thugs want to be able to charge money on internet that would give jobs to young people in their, in their states. So at the end of the day, we can't talk around the problem. I think we're too polite in the African innovation space. We gotta point our fingers at our elite who continue to impoverish people because of their business decisions, because of their political decisions. But that's why innovation must threaten the status quo. Because if the innovations we are introducing do not threaten the status quo, then I don't understand why elites will listen to us. No, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. Now, we tried that approach, mm. right? We spent four or five years believing that, oh, if we showed them a model, like you said, they might listen to us. Now we understand that will not happen. So now we understand that we have to now get into the political space and aggregate the anger from people, our peers, young people who are outside this venue right now, who are angry that women are not safe in a society where we can survey everybody. Indeed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So my point is, Africa's political and business elite are in cahoots with each other to keep the masses poor. And until that changes, until innovators are standing up to say that because it is the truth, it would remain that way. It's competitive dynamism. So we saw the way that Twitter initially was a threat to regimes in the Middle East. It was obvious, Arab Spring, so so and so, until governments got better at harnessing the same tools for repressive purposes. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a competitive dynamism game. Absolutely. We have to understand where our innovations can threaten the status quo, where we can mobilize the, audience, the masses through the same technologies, and if indeed, if Effectively, we are doing that, we are playing that role, which I don't think we are very well. No, we were not yet. And, the, and that, I think that is a challenge. And as he stated before, we keep talking about innovation. Real innovation is not going to happen until we put, as he's been saying, pressure on the politics and we talk about the government. Mm. Because, for example, there's no excuse why when you know, I was building talent base, I had to go all the way to the FRS, talk to all the different you know, taxing bodies just to say, okay, how can we solve this one issue? So I'm spending all this valuable time that I could be innovating on how we can effectively put payroll to SME hands, and I'm just trying to solve a basic problem that all over in the world has already been solved. Mm. And this is going back to the government. But it's, so it's, it's high audiences time. audiences are not you, yes. but their audience are multilateral institutions, yes. etc. Yeah. They don't have the same incentive to listen to people like us. Yeah. You know, so long as most decisions are still taken in Western capitals and Western multilateral organizations determine what is cool and what is sensible and what is best practice and what is not best practice, they, are, they think that, you know, we are trying to comply with international best practice. They don't understand why local innovators should have a voice in that. Let me give you an example. The work that I do, the U.S. and Europe are still end course to providing a mechanism for consumers to check medicines. In the U.S., it's been on for 20 years. They keep postponing the deadline. In about five <laughs> years from now, you'll be able to walk into a Walgreens or a CVS and verify medicine. We have been doing that in Nigeria for a decade, and by then we'll have been doing it for longer. The question is, if the Nigerian government wants advice on how to manage their supply chain, they're still not going to come to me. So my understanding of the geopolitics of it is that it's intricately tied to the politics. Mindset have to change in which we understand the role of Africa in the world. We can't do it only at the local level, Absolutely. because people think of it in very different ways. And I think that is so fundamental, particularly in truly global dynamics like technology and innovation. Yeah. We have to understand the role of Africa in the world but, and the place of Africa but, in the but world. But maybe we should talk about some bright spots. <laughs> <laughs> talk, uh, because we have five minutes left. Okay. And, I, and I, there is, I don't know if it's necessarily a bright spot, but I, it's particularly for yourself and, and for Fatimata, um, who have made this transition from being straight uh, entrepreneurs to, you're still entrepreneurs, but to uh, backing entrepreneurs uh, with funds uh, or building funds. Um, and I'm trying to understand very quickly, because we have very little time, what that process is like and uh, how you're focused. Sure. Or I who you're focused yeah, on. Of I course. Say. I think, you know, at some point I was just tired of asking myself, why them? And I was like, why not us, right? So I'm very passionate about solving. Um, problems are tied into you know, seed entrepreneurship because it's the toughest thing and it's where the risk is highest because it's not only about money, it's about also execution. I was also passionate trying to solve this kind of gap about regions focus. So for instance, when you look at all the deals that happened last year in Africa, they amount up to $1 billion, but 90% of the money went to three countries, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. When you look also at the gender gap, you know, for instance, when you look at seed from an um, IFC perspective, they actually report 51% male entrepreneurs, 49% female at seed. When you look at series CD, it's 90% male, 10% female. 
It's like, you know, for women, you need to have only microfinancing, mm -hmm. but we don't have, you know, micro dreams. We have macro dreams. We have also <laughs> big dreams. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, if, if there is someone that can go and, and, and put personal money and then raise more money to back female and male entrepreneurs at seed in West Africa, maybe that has to be someone like me or E. And I decided to take the leap of faith. And, and so far, we are very successful deploying capital, getting great cash and cash returns, and actually raising a bigger fund. So it's not easy, but it's definitely possible. And we have a strong sense of urgency, because until we put the money ourselves, we won't attract the global quality investors and also the ta next, African tycoon to come and back us to create a f full value chain of, of capitalism. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I took a break after uh, my last company, Flutterwave, where we were trying to connect Africa to the global economy, and I really had to rethink the, the, the core of the work that we do, because, you know, we can build this $100 million companies really fast, but at the end of the day, if we don't have more of them, we can't change the fortunes of the continent. So what I do today, um, I run the Future Africa group, and literally what, what we focus on is how can we design a society in conversation with the relevant stakeholders, a 100-year plan where we are able to create a society where everybody has access to purpose and prosperity. So they do jobs they like, they can make money doing it. And we then look for the people and organizations already doing the work, and we support them with all the knowledge that we have about the work that we do. Um, it, it's tough work. It's very difficult because oftentimes you're competing with DFIs who have vastly different agendas right. and you're not going to get the attention of the political class or the business class in your own country because your long-term goals directly defy what their own short-term interests are. Um, but we, we've been pretty successful doing this, again, playing the cat and mouse game. So we'll keep doing it as long as we can. Um, you know, recently there was a company we back called Kobo 360, which is trying to solve the logistics problem at a very high level that Fatuma had discussed, where essentially you have truck drivers, they're going one route completely full, coming back empty, and there's a lot of work to be done to continue to reduce the cost of logistics. And, you know, now they're a hundred million dollar company after we've worked with them for close to 12 months. And there are many more examples like that. Talked about African Genome, there's a company called 54 Gene that we're working very closely with, seeded them, working closely with them to help them build the African genome so we can start having more creative solutions to these problems. I, I think the technology exists, um, the young people are eager, and the only stumbling block in our way today are our own political and business elites, which is sad. And we're gonna change that. Um, and, but I think until that changes, the, the prospects for the African innovator are pretty grim. Well, we don't want to end there, <laughs> but we are going to end. <laughs> I, I actually think the prospects for Africa innovators, just on the, yeah. even just listening to you to talk about uh, back of them, uh, are pretty bright because there are, there, I, I see this all the time in our work of quotes. I, I see uh, the stories coming through. I, I see the pictures I get, and I know how much has changed in the five years. Since, we, since we've been doing this. When you and I first started talking, people were funding things with $50,000 and celebrating it. So now we, we have, uh, I think this, so far this year, there have been 50 companies that have been funded for, by, you know, with over a million dollars. Not a lot of money in, in, in the, the grand scheme the, of, grand scheme of things, <laughs> but a huge investors. and more oh, women investors. Um, but uh, we have to wrap it there. I could do this for another 45 minutes, uh, but uh, WEF will not allow. So, <laughs> uh, listen, uh, everyone, please th join me in thanking uh, our excellent panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.